for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. And this will be a recorded session. And I just want to just welcome everybody to our Native American Heritage Month presentation. And this time we're going to be bringing to you Mr. Darius Smith out of Denver, Colorado. So we're really excited to hear his message today and his work, things about his work and how things are happening in Denver, which, you know, where we just started here in Flagstaff with an Indigenous commission and um, working on some on some really good things for our indigenous community members and surrounding indigenous nations. So I, I really would like to have some of this knowledge to be brought forward so people kind of have an idea of some of the things that we're hopeful to bring along those lines of building bridges and relationships and in that kinship way um, for our people out here um, in relation to our, our or non-Indian, um, non-Indigenous relatives. So I really appreciate this time with you. Um, first, I want to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Rose Tohi, and I am um, uh, I'm from the Diné and Ute nations, and I have lived in Flagstaff for um, a little over forty-five years. And I really appreciate the time that I have here. This is where I start. This is where I went to school. This is where I started my professional career. And I also made a life here with my husband and three adult sons now. So that's who I am. My clans are Tachi um, Ninotai is my mom's clan. And that's who I am. My father's, ten, my, my father's clan is Kentachitni, um, Red House clan. And my um, paternal grandfather um, is uh, that's yucca fruit hung on a string. And then um, my, my maternal grandfathers are Ashin, which is salt clan. So that's who I am as a Dine um, Ute woman. And um, so I want to introduce our very good relative here, Darius Smith. Um, he serves as the director of the Denver Anti-Discrimination Office within the Agency for Human Rights and Community Partnerships. Here he um, facilitates resolution of civil rights discrimination complaints by utilizing the indigenous form of peacemaking. This is resolving conflict and disputes by using common sense principles and encouraging ethical settlements. He also proudly provides staff support for the Denver American Indian and African American com commissions. He was born and raised in Denver, but, sp but spent many of his summer months with his maternal grandmother out here and, and around Tupa City, Arizona. So I want to introduce him. He's um, He's raised in a predominantly urban community, um, but influenced heavily by his culture, language, and expertise of the Navajo way of life. So I want you to just listen to his presentation and just um, grab and, and, and be sponges today for the information that you'll be receiving. I thank you so much and I'll give it to him to um, give to give him his side of who he is on his personal side, um, and then and then leading into his professional um, work. Yeah, Darius. Thank you so much, Rose. And uh, I didn't realize that we actually have we're clan related. Um, so on my mother's side, I'm Hushkahutsoho, and on my father's side. I'm trying not to use this term because a really good friend of mine, my relative uh, Red Milk Cody is trying to um, start this movement to move away from saying Nakai Klejini. And um, it's, I have a shirt. She sent me a shirt recently. So Rose, help me out. How do you say that? N N A H I. you see that? Uh -huh. Nahisi. Yes. So, Anyhow, there's a, I'm organizing a presentation with uh, Radmilla. We're gonna do a webinar on December 12th around 
Navajo Black identity. We, we've got, got some really cool things lined up. Um, we're actually, after this meeting, it's going to be our second planning. But again, it's going to be December 12th uh, in the evening. And so I'll definitely share it with you, Rose, and you can share it out to the broader community. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. And I was so excited to have uh, met Rose through a Indigenous Municipal Network that has just recently started. And I did a presentation of the history of the Denver American Indian Commission. Uh, this, that's a totally different presentation. However, I'll touch upon a, a few of the things that, that we've done in, in the last 14 years. So Denver has like a 14 year head start on you all, but um, I'm definitely gonna talk about the, um, the highs and the lows. And uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my presentation. Um, so let's see, let's make sure this works. There you go. You all can hear that? All right. So my constructed personal identity is, is an interesting one where strongly identify with being Navajo, Black, urban. And fortunately for me, spending my summers um, on in, in around Loop, Arizona and, and Tuba City really gave me a really good foundation of, of who I was. Um, and fortunately for me, um, growing up in an all black neighborhood here in Denver, um, at the time, uh, it was about 86% African American. And, and being a decent athlete, I, I think uh, it's definitely celebrated. So a lot of um, things came from being an athlete, um, a lot of privilege. So, so eventually I was able to get um, scholarships because of my running. I went to the University of Arizona um, and um, was a track and field athlete there, ran hurdles, uh, had a, an amazing older brother who was an amazing role model to me. And um, again, I kind of flew through uh, college with, with all that extra support of scholarships and tutoring and just being around positive people. Um, so uh, moved back to Denver uh, after graduating from college. Took me about five years because I did transfer a couple of times. And it was interesting because when I moved back to Denver, I had no clue about all the native organizations in town. And I, I soon learned that Denver was the hub of Indian country. And so I immediately got a job with the Council of Energy Resource Tribes and one of my former colleagues actually is on this call right now. She'll probably introduce herself later. Her name is Jean Rubin. Uh, she was legal counsel there at the Council of Energy Resource Tribes. I eventually um, moved on to become the director of the Denver Public Schools Indian Education Program, which I did for about six to eight years, and then uh, moved on to uh, Habitat for Humanity um, and did some national work. Um, around Indian housing. Um, before I jump into this presentation, I, I just wanted to, to kind of back up about work in Indian country. Um, it was around 1995, 1996, um, and I had to submit a proposal to the U.S. Department of Education for the Indian Education Program here in Denver, and it's a formula grant, so it wasn't it wasn't really difficult. It was, it was basically six to 10 pages. And so um, I read the proposal as it had been presented um, two years. I think at that time you had to present it every two to three years. And I read the proposal and, and it had a very negative, um, it, it, it was basically, I was depressed after I read it. And it said, you know, we had the lowest um, uh, attainment of education. We had, um, you know, issues with diabetes, we had issues with alcoholism, and I'm looking at this, and it just, you know, it, it just gave, sent the wrong message, and at the time, I was working with these, uh, uh, an amazing nonprofit in Denver, it's no longer here, it was called Assets Colorado, and there was a Latina woman over there, and a Lakota woman, and um, so I had been doing some just going to meetings with them and, and actually uh, learning about what they were doing. And I asked them, could they do some facilitated 
work with the, the parent committee with the Indian Education Program in Denver. We did, we had a series of focus groups and we uh, utilized what we got from the uh, workshops and put it in the proposal submitted to the US Department of Ed. To tell this story is an interesting thing because what happened was the specialist at the US Department of Indian Ed was a non-native uh, person. And I don't remember her name, but she, when she received the proposal from Denver, she read it and in a very flippant way said, well, if they're doing so good, they don't need any funding. And she put the, my proposal for Denver Public Schools, Indian Education, she put it in the unfunded the, uh, pile. And fortunately for, for us, the deputy of the um, US Department of Ed at the time, Indian Education was a woman by the name of Sheila Cooper. She was uh, Seneca, she's Seneca. And uh, she read their proposal and she was a little surprised why it was unfund in the unfundable pile. She read it and she just said, oh my God, this is brilliant what, what they're doing in Denver. And she immediately got me on the phone and she said, I love your proposal. Can you come out to, 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 to DC and meet with the entire Indian Ed uh, staff? And it kind of freaked me out. And she said, um, we can get you here right away. So within about a couple of weeks or so, I was in DC and I met with the entire staff of Indian Ed. And she just asked me a series of questions of, why did I write the proposal from an assets perspective? And I just told her the story about myself growing up in a, in a black neighborhood and black community. And I had all these black role models, um, peers pushing me forward to, to, to be the best person I could be. And, and um, I just, I talked about the, the issues of, of alcoholism and all the things that that is obvious in, in our tribal communities. And, and so anyway, to make a long story short, she, she really said, you know, we love what you're doing. And instead of giving, you know, we were applying for like 160,000, she ended up giving us 200,000. And she just said, continue to do your work. And then at that point, I was then uh, working with Seattle Public Schools, uh, Chicago Public Schools, and, and just working with uh, the Indian education programs to really start basically giving them technical assistance about how to do community engagement from an assets perspective. And so that, that's an important um, um, element in my today's presentation. And I kind of wanted to start with that. So let me continue. So I'm excited to report that we have new numbers, uh, census numbers from the 2020 census. And these numbers were uh, incredible to to, uh, to get because the projections were not expected to be these, this high. And I think that it just is a testament to, um, you know, our, our folks who work for the federal government around in, in census and, and trying to um, uh, encourage uh, our native people to participate in, in the census. So basically these are the new numbers. So um, it's, 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 noted that the total population for American Indians in the US is almost 10 million now. Um, if you just looked at American Indian or Alaska Native only, that number is around 3.7. But again, these numbers in City of Flagstaff and, and, and other municipalities, they would use uh, numbers in combination. So uh, American Indian and Alaska Native alone and in combination. So mixed bloods like myself, would be get, we get counted. Um, the number, um, total number actually pushes the American Indian population to almost 3% of the total population. Um, still working on trying to get projections for 50 years from now, 40 years from now. Um, the largest tribes uh, in the United States are the Cherokees, the Navajos, the Choctaws, the MAI, or the Mexican American Indians, or indigenous peoples from Mexico. Uh, Chippewa and Lakotas. And, uh, you know, I have relatives in Flagstaff, and it's so funny. I have three cousins, female cousins, and they all married um, Mexican nationalists. And, and so it's pretty cool to see my uh, younger nephews and nieces uh, speaking, you know, English, Navajo, and Spanish. So um, you got a really amazing um, population there in Flagstaff. So there are 13 states 
with uh, 200,000 or more. And of course, Arizona is gonna be on that list. Uh, Colorado's on that list. Um, New Mexico, of course, and I don't think uh, Utah's on there, but um, the media, median age for American Indians is a lot younger than the national. Um, we're at just, a, just under 30, the age of 34, young population. Um, there are 335 state and federally recognized reservations. Um, in terms of federally recognized tribes, that number has blossomed and ballooned up to 574. 78% of all American Indians now live um, in cities like Denver, Flagstaff, um, Albuquerque, Phoenix. And um, this median income is, is a national stat um, and that looks different in, in metropolitan areas. Uh, unemployment rates um, anywhere from 45 to 80%. And that's primarily natives that live on reservations. Um, natives, uh, you know, start migrating in the relocation uh, period in the 50s, mid, mid 50s, and then started picking up in the 90s again. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. So I, I mentioned that uh, these numbers are, are pretty incredible and, and these numbers have really blossomed. Um, I think before this presentation was updated, I think that number, we, there was a projection that it was going to be around six six to seven. And so the numbers really far exceeded the, um, the, uh, ex, you know, the projections. Um, wow, I got a lot of slides devoted to stenses. I, I love it. Anyhow, uh, talked about that already. Um, got some really cool graphics, graphics on my presentation and this again is states. Uh, we have 13 states and you can see that Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado is on that list. Um, just kind of reinforces what I've already said. The deterioration of Indian country. So these are these maps from 1850 to 1865 to 1880 to, eight, to 1990. And, you know, we'll, when, when I do this presentation, it's the majority of the populations are non-natives. And, and one of the things I talk about is manifest destiny as, as colonization was being pushed west, this is what was happening. They're pushing all the natives um, on the other side of the Mississippi. Um, 15 years later, around 1865, there was uh, gold, gold was um, struck in, in California, west coast. And then that now started to push natives from both directions, the West and the East. 15 years later, that's what Indian country looked like. There was a big concerted effort to try to move all natives to Oklahoma. There was, um, uh, you know, some natives, tribes resisted. And uh, it's just, you know, one of those things that um, it's horrible. You know, I have, uh, uh, I teach uh, contemporary uh, native studies and I, I typically start from 1900 until contemporary times because I, I, I truly believe that all of our higher education institutions like um, NAU and, and UNM and uh, University of Colorado, ASU, um, they do a good job of telling the history of um, the American Indian and, and the interaction and it's usually relegated to um, the past. And so that's why a lot of folks don't really get um, a, a really true understanding or appreciation of what the current um, state of Indian country is like. So um, fast forward 100 years, that's what Indian country looked like. You can see Navajo Nation down there, huge reservation. Um, so this uh, is, is where the reservations are today. Um, and of course, the, the Diné, we got pushed out of Colorado. Two of our sacred mountains are in Colorado. The Navajos have four sacred mountains. One's right there near, near Flag. We have Hesperus and um, uh, what's the other one, Blanca, that are in Colorado. A lot of people don't know that. Um, Indian land removal timeline. timeline. So I, I, I like to have this 
uh, in my presentation because what it shows is there's been good times and there's been bad times. Um, 1887, they were basically, it was a land giveaway, just giving away native land left and right. By the 19, by 1915, there was this uh, effort to um, also uh, continue to take the land away and, you know, competency uh, was, was, was needed. Um, terms like grandfathered, um, you know, if, if, if a native didn't speak um, or write in English, you know, they would have to, they, they would lose their right to the land. However, white farmers, if, you know, if, if, if they couldn't speak or if they couldn't write well in English, as long as their grandfather did. So that term actually comes from that. Um, again, they were just giving away um, native land, no revenue was given. Uh, land was lost, no, you know, to tax collectors and banks. And um, by the 1930s, though, this is this is a good time that uh, you know it was right after the New Deal, uh, the Indian uh, the Indian New Deal was to um, to preserve culture, promote economic development, stop loss of land uh, from allotment, returning um, lands to tribes, and um, this went on for about 10 years, and it was, a, it was a, a, a period of flourishing for Native country and the relations with the U.S. government. And then the United States entered into World War II, and then there was a, a push to terminate uh, tribes, um, and, and it was happening left and right. And again, forced assimilation, uh, funding of, um, uh, you know, the treaty the, the trust responsibilities were just being ignored left and right. And that went on again, 30 years, uh, the seventies, um, there was uh, a big push for the Indian Self-Determination and uh, Education Assistance Act. Um, and again, I think this was happening during, you know, the Kennedy administration into the Nixon administration. So again, uh, the Dems and the Republicans were in, a, in an effort to repair a lot of the um, the damage that had been done. Um, I, I leave this in my presentation from 18, uh, from 2008 to 2016, that eight year period, um, President Obama um, actually held six official conferences with Indian nations. And so, uh, and that was, that was really an important time. I think that what we're seeing now is, is a direct result from this, that relationship that, that was being built because it was broken for a four year period and um, we're now in a, in a, in a good time. Uh, Indian boarding schools. I, I like covering this because when, when I worked in Indian education, I remember why a lot of the Indian parents were not you know, participatory uh, parents with their children's education and then um, started working with uh, some really amazing natives in Denver and they said, we have to start talking about this boarding school um, issue. And this is in the 90s. And, and so to, to see what's going on now is, is pretty amazing because, um, you know, this is a direct correlation to why so many of our Native uh, relatives are, are, are struggling with, um, you know, just with their identity. Um, again, from 1870 to 1940s, it was, it was all forced. Um, and, and, and as this picture shows, there was a period where the boarding schools were ran by the Department of War. And so they were basically making little soldiers. And um, children were placed in very harsh military-like institutions. All things natives were forbidden, the dress, the language, the beliefs. Affection was rare, uh, punishment often severe. Um, some of the students were raped, many tried to run away and unknown numbers died. Um, and this, this is interesting because a lot of the stuff that's coming out right now with uh, what's going on in Canada with the residential schools and, and how that mirrors what happened in the U.S., um, it's uh, pretty amazing and just it's horrific. I believe those numbers are over 7,000 bodies, little children that they found up in Canada. So my mother actually, uh, you're gonna see here in this little clip here on the next slide. She went to Fort Wingate um, and uh, she went to boarding school. She has an amazing story. So she's in this little piece and uh, I wanna show this right now. 
Can you all hear that? The boarding and school policy was far reaching and devastating as any, maybe more than any, because of the complete and utter destruction of the culture. They couldn't stop it from happening. So they would take them from further away and make it harder for them children to leave and go home. It was my first haircut. I cried when I saw my hair on the floor. Tears still well up in my eyes when I remember the way it laid on the floor. Without my Navajo language, I was broken and unable to celebrate my heritage, to express myself. Taking my identity from me made me very powerless. I managed to learn uh, how to stop all the uh, I'm sorry. The loneliness that came because I was could not talk to my mother or my father. And we were not comforted by the boarding school matrons or teachers. The pain and the loneliness and the the anger will always be with me. We are dealing with the erasure of our people. There, this government has been working on destroying tribal societies and institutions for 500 years. Um, I, I work with youth on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation quite often, and so many of them tell me that they walk around with like a heavy load on their shoulders. They feel heavy all the time. And I truly believe that what that is, is they're, they're carrying the traumas of their ancestors and they're carrying the traumas of their, their parents and their grandparents. Um, and then they have to carry their own traumas. It's like our, our great, beautiful blanket kind of got all chopped into pieces during that boarding school time or that time when we were trying to assimilate. And we have a lot of the pieces left, and now we're trying to put them all back together. And we're, we're putting them all back together but it's probably never gonna look exactly like our blanket was before. So, but it will still keep us warm. It'll still help us, it will still sustain us. And it hurts to know that I can't give them the things that my parents could have given me if not for boarding school. Only by bringing it into the light can we begin to heal from it. And that's the first step that we're moving for. If our tribal cultures are going to stay alive other than existing as pockets of poverty and sadness, uh, we have to heal. And telling the story and then help finding resources to turn things around that's what the, the coalition wants to do. The uh, eventual outcomes we would hope uh, would come out of the boarding school healing project would be uh, uh, healing programs that are put together by our own Indian people in their own Indian communities. We're changing the paradigm of education each day. Uh, we're saving the language one child at a time. 
how do you preserve a language? Thank you, speaker. This healing is not just happening on the native side. It's not just for us that needs to heal over this history. It's also um, the non-native community that's really struggling with this healing. Much more important that we share with our children, that we tell them stories. It's not a very easy thing to do, but be strong. People my age need to be strong and just think about where we've been and teach it to our children. All right. Um, every time I, I see that, it just amazes me to see my mother. She was the one in the, like the, the, the blue top with the uh, coral uh, necklace. Um, the, I remember I, in the 90s, and I, the first time I actually started having conversations with her about her boarding school experience they're at Talani Lake and, and, and Fort Wingate, and, um, and then uh, eventually graduating from Winslow Public School. Um, she couldn't make it 30 seconds into, the, into her talk, and she now has been doing it for you know, 25 years, and now she's a, an amazing speaker uh, about her boarding school experience, and, and um, she goes and does public speaking engagements. She'll be 80 years old um, in, that, uh, in January, but you know, it's, 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 that's where um, I got a lot of my power too, because I didn't understand why a lot of native people were, were you know, didn't want to talk about boarding school. And so that's something that all of our communities have to deal with. And, and again, it's, it's dealing with trauma. And so cultural trauma, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma. So I'm working with Indian Aid, 1996, worked with the Native American Counseling Service, and we did this uh, uh, presentation, and we, we recognized a, uh, a professor from DU who had been doing some work around American Indian Genocide Project, um, historical trauma, and um, her name was uh, Dr. Marie Yellowhorse Braveheart. I, I might messed up her name there. Um, but she was the one that started coining that, that term. And so she came out and did a presentation. We packed the auditorium at a local high school. We had a couple hundred, 400 individuals there. And I saw a change in the native community after that presentation, because what, what happened was we had native American counseling services there. We had, um, you know, other folks who, we're working with the city and county of Denver. And afterwards, um, you know, I, I got a chance to go up there and talk about Indian Ed, uh, about, you know, being part of the parent committee. And more and more parents started to, to get involved. And we went from like a few Indian parents coming on a regular basis to at least 20. And it was, it was a beautiful thing. And I think that, you know, I, I, I take it right back to that presentation and, and dealing with um, the, the issues of uh, boarding school and dealing with trauma. So I, uh, in my introduction, I briefly talked a little bit about, um, you know, Indian urbanization. Um, so in the 1950s, um, you know, there was this push to, to move natives off reservation, Indian relocation. Um, and these are the cities, these are original cities that, um, that were uh, identified and, and natives were encouraged to move. Um, this particular um, flyer, that's the actual flyer that was used throughout Navajo country up in the Dakotas with the tribes in South Dakota to encourage people to move to Denver. But again, um, relocation and in Indian urbaniz urbanization basically was a form of termination. It was again, forced natives off the reservation by offering job training opportunities in urban areas. Individuals um, were made at, at the beginning to sign agreements that they would not return to their reservations. A lot of people don't know that. The percentage of Indians living um, in urban areas grew 
from 13 13 percent to 40 44 percent by 1970. So this that's about a 20 year period. Um, again, these these communities are these populations. Uh, we're moving to cities like L.A., New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, Denver, Albuquerque, uh, Oklahoma. And I also take it that Flagstaff was a, a destination because it was so close to my reservation. And as part of the, the new emphasis on assimilation in the late 40s and the 50s, the BIA distributed these that, that particular flyer that you see right there um, to, to encourage them uh, to move the cities. And then thousands of uh, natives relocated. I, I know a lot of native families in the Denver area, for instance, have been, been here since the 50s and you know, look, uh, looking at like three, four generations now. Um, again, um, this particular slide kind of looks at, you know, how that kind of picked up from the 1990s uh, to 2010 to 2020. And um, uh, that, get, that, that, that numbers pretty blows people away that, you know, 40, you know, 80 percent of all natives live in um, urban communities. Um, the red power movement, the American Indian movement. I'm a benefactor because of what the American Indian movement did in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And, you know, they did some protests, they did resistance to, to bring attention to the plight of what was happening in Indian country um, in, in cities. I, I know that one of the things that they asked for was having a seat at the table. And, you know, in a lot of ways, um, that's how I got my position. And, and we have this commission in Denver is, is you know, it took a, a while to, to, to get to that point. And, and now you all are looking at, you have a commission looking at indigenous initiatives. But anyhow, I leave this in here because uh, I'm a benefactor and I'm just very proud to be, uh, you know, a recipient of the, of the work that they did. So I'm a, this is me. This is me back uh, when I had short hair, when I was running track in college. And that's a picture of my family. You see my mother up there and my siblings, and that's my father. And I strongly identify with both being black and native. And I mentioned my clans. And again, um, I'm uh, trying not to use Nakai Klijini as much because it has derogatory uh, infer inferences in, uh, in, in the Navajo community. So I, I put this up in my presentation because it's my actual birth certificate issued by the state of Colorado. I was born at St. Anthony's Hospital in 1967. And it says that my dad, Jerry Edmund Smith was Negro and my mother, Bessie Rose Paddock was Indian. And putting this present presentation together a few months ago, I asked my sisters to see their, um, their birth certificates and one, my oldest sister, it was, it was really interesting. Her said, father Negro, mother red, the color red, which was really, and this was issued by the state of Colorado. And, and so working in civil rights, often, um, you know, folks who are, um, who are not native or, or who are white, often they talk about why you always want to talk about race. And, and, and again, it's, it's a really, an interesting dynamic about, you know, the legal construct of what race is and how it impacts, you know, unfortunately it impacts um, native people negatively or people of color. <laughs> I don't know why it's doing that, but anyhow, I already talked about that. I'm trying to fast forward, there we go. <laughs> um, I'm 18 years old, I'm getting ready to go to college. And my brother showed me a document that blew me away. It was my tribal enrollment. Um, I had never seen it before, I was again, 18. But again, what tribal status is, it's a political classification and natives are the only minority group to have their own US code, Title 25. And, and again, this is why natives can, can can have casinos and this is they they can exercise tribal sovereignty and, and determine membership and their form of government legislate adopt civil and criminal laws 
uh, administer justice and to also banish natives from Indian reservations in Indian country. I know years ago, um, before he passed, Russell Means uh, was married to a Na Navajo woman and he um, got caught up in a domestic violence situation and the Navajo Nation actually banished uh, Russell Means from, from our reservation. Um, and then, you know, the power for, so for sovereignty. And, and I think that's a, an important thing. Um, so enrollment criteria is tribal affiliation, blood quantum, residency, citizen, citizenship, as well as cultural ties. These are things that are all tied to Navajo, all things Navajo. You have Window Rock, you have our Great Seal, the flag, a lot of turquoise, Navajos and turquoise, um, and, and Monument Valley, which is kind of like on my side of, of the reservation, western side of the Navajo reservation. So my beautiful mother, um, this is her actual enrollment um, documentation uh, document. It's, it's uh, issued by the Navajo Nation. And you got to keep in mind that the Navajo Nation um, became a sovereign. Uh, they, they, their form of government wasn't established until uh, June, yeah, I'm sorry, January 1st, 1940. So my mom was born in 42. So her, her census number is pretty, uh, she's like, she's one of the OG originals with uh, the Navajo Nation. And so um, her tribal, again, this is issued by the Navajo Nation, not the federal government. And it says that she's four-fourths Dene. She's four-fourths degree Navajo Indian blood census number. My mom also went to Fort Lewis College, met my father, who was at the time, I think they only had three black uh, athletes. My dad was an athlete there. And she took, she took it upon herself to enroll, enroll all of us. And it really made it really easy for us uh, as we went to college and when uh, you know you had COVID relief funding and all that. So this is my enrollment um, document and it says that I'm one half degree Navajo Indian blood. That's my census number down there, my Indian census roll number. And again, I didn't see this until I was 18 years old. I laughed when my brother first pulled it out and showed it to me. He says, you're gonna apply to college from this point forward. Every time you say you're native, you're gonna have to show them this. Wow blew me away. So this next one is my beautiful daughter. She's 26 years old. Her name is Savannah. This is her enrollment. Savannah's mother is Latina and black. So Savannah is half, technically she's half black, a quarter Latina and a quarter Dene Navajo. And it, it, this is a interesting dynamic because if and when my daughter decides to have children, if the father's not Dene, if he's not Navajo, the, in, the Navajo blood stops with her. And it's, it's just a crazy, crazy dynamic. So again, this is the three generations. Uh, this is a dated picture. Um, mom, my daughter, Savannah, and me. So often people say, well, where did this come from? And it comes from Congress. And, and what they did was they set the blood quantum to one quarter. They hold to it as a rigid standard definition of what it is to be Indian, native. Intermarriage has proceeded for centuries, just like my mother and my father. And then eventually Indians will be defined out of existence. And when that happens, the federal government will be freed of its persistent Indian problem. And this was uh, uh, the former uh, Colorado State historian, uh, Patricia Nelson Limerick is also a um, professor up at CU in CU Boulder. So again, like I mentioned, this is a, uh, congressional efforts to limit and it was it's been reinforced the blood quantum um, you know during the general allotment act indian reorganization act federal recognition statutes so um being half black is, is an interesting dynamic because i understood what it was to be there was this dynamic in 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 a, an american society was if you were one if you were one drop black you were, you were considered black. And it's actually, it's the opposite. So those things run counter opposite was, you know, again, um, the United States Congress did this to, to encourage slavery. And then the blood quantum was to diminish the, the native, uh, the blood and to eventually take the land. 
And that's the difference. Uh, the one drop rule and the blood quantum, what's the difference? Is more slaves to work the land and then less Indians means less Indian and they can take the land. So complexities of Indian identity. Um, you know, this is when, when, when people, when you're just taught a historical perspective of Navajo country or what it is to be native, this is what is, is people invoke this image of, this is what Navajo is. You know, velveteen uh, shirts and turquoise and, you know, on the reservation. And the reality is uh, for so many, 80% of our population now lives in cities. This is my family. And this is a, a picture that's at uh, History Colorado. And I was fortunate to get a lot of my nieces, nephews, daughter, my mother, brother to, to get together and took a picture. And, and that's a contemporary uh, Navajo family. So, the economics of and impacts of Indian gaming. I, I, I think this is really important because the Navajo Nation and, you know, they have the, the casino right outside of Flagstaff. Um, Navajo Nation's got a couple of facilities, but when I put this together, it blew me away. It just totally blew me away because in uh, 2019, just uh, right before the pandemic, uh, 245 tribes, they operated 474 gaming facilities in 29 states. Uh, combined uh, with US commercial casinos, like what you see in Vegas and, and um, other parts of the, in California, and tribal casinos, it generates about $78 billion in total revenue. In 2019, um, the non-tribal casinos generated about 43 billion in revenue. But if you just look at what tribes casinos generate, it's around almost 35 billion in revenue. So it's, it's pretty amazing that uh, tribes contribute about 40%, 44% of all the casino revenue in the US. So that's, that's a game changer. When, when you start to show and, and highlight natives contributions, um, at, at, from an economic perspective, it's a game changer. And, um, you know, here in Denver in 2015, the Denver American Indian Commission partnered with the Rocky Mountain Indian Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is a nonprofit chamber of commerce, and the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs. And we worked in concert with the state economic and the city of Denver's uh, economic offices to really dig deep and to come up with um, you know, what the contributions were to, for, for the American um, Indian population tribes in the state of Colorado. And, and the, the um, contributions was basically $2 billion. And when we did, when we, we rolled it out and, and presented it back to the, you know, mainstream, it does change, it, it, changed the, it changes the dynamic. And, and I think you know, at, at, a, at a very surface level, what it does is it changes the narrative that natives are just consumers and we, we take resources. When this was done, when that economic impact report was done for American Indians, Alaska Natives in, in, in Denver and the state of Colorado, that started to change the narrative. Um, I'm gonna jump to DNA. I think uh, this was pretty, this was an interesting thing that happened to me last year was my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, she was like, hey, let's do this uh, Ancestry.com. Um, and we did it. And, and my, these are my results. And it's really interesting because um, it came back that I was basically 50% indigenous, 31% African, and 19% European. And it was, um, you know, I, I, I started to really think about that in an in a, in a interesting way because in my position, I, I get calls all the time. People take this test and, and they, I'm native and how do I get enrolled? And, and you know, this, this thing doesn't say that I'm Navajo, it just says indigenous North America. And, and it's not tribal specific. And so what I have to tell folks is before you start making phone calls and trying to contact tribes to get enrolled, you know, I have to explain to them that DNA testing and, and what it means for, uh, to be native is that Basic ancestry DNA testing may be available to tell you about relationships between families, but sovereign tribal nations determine their own requirements for their membership, just like 
uh, you saw my uh, presentation, um, my travel enrollment card earlier. And then there is no test offered by any lab that can tell you specifically which tribe you may be from. This uh, individual is uh, probably one of the profound, I mean, the most uh, prolific uh, writer about Native uh, American DNA. Her name is uh, Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly Tallbear. And uh, she does podcasts and she has a book, several books, and she's a professor up in Canada. So she's a friend of mine. Indian identity. So this is a picture of Savannah in 2002. We went to a protest up in a little small community um, just north of Denver um, and where they had a racist mascot. And that was her sign. It says, I am not a mascot in a little uh, sad face. But anyhow, um, Indian identity has been, you know, one of those things where I saw it. I, it wasn't even on my radar until I became became director of Indian education and I saw how it impacted native youth and native families. And um, again, this, this plays out in our communities all the time. Natives, young people have difficult uh, for native youth to develop a sense of pride in their heritage. Uh, they internalize these stereotypes of, 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 of their people and conflicting youth cultures, gangs, assimilation, dominant society, mixed blood issues. You know, when, when I originally started using this presentation, you see the Cleveland Indians. Uh, they finally got rid of theirs, the Cleveland Guardians. Um, you have the NFL team in Washington finally got rid of theirs. And, and it just, it, it wasn't, it didn't happen just because, you know, their ownership uh, wanted to do the right thing. I think uh, there was uh, Native organizations that really put pressure on them to, from an economic perspective, to show that you know, you're going to lose sponsors. And, and, and that was a reality. And, and it really forced that. I think we have a couple of teams at the professional ranks, Kansas City Chiefs, you have um, the Atlanta Braves, and then the Chicago Blackhawks are the three uh, remaining professional teams that are going to have to make a, a decision here soon. Um, who is Indian? This guy's not Indian. This guy, Iron Eyes Cody, the crying Indian. He played in 270 plus movies. He always played the stereotypical stoic, noble savage, you know, speaking in that, that broken English. And this guy, when he died January 4th, 1999, you know, it, it made national news. And, and um, it was really interesting because his family came forward. I think the family was from, from Alabama. They, they said, nah, he, we we're not native. This guy went to Hollywood because he was fascinated with Westerns and he went out there and started playing it. But this guy, he, he, he played it to the, you know, every day he would dress up, put a wig on, buckskin, and it, it's, it's an embarrassment. But, um, you know, this type of fraud continues to happen, you know, not just in Indian country, but it happens in um, the black community. A couple of years ago, you had the Rachel Dolenzer issue up in Spokane, Washington. She, she was elected to be the president of the NAACP in, in Washington. And then her family came forward and said, this is a white woman masquerading as a, as a black woman. And so again, this, this is, it's a weird dynamic and uh, gotta be very cautious about this. And um, I think that people are much more aware of it. Um, again, you know, I talked a little bit about the Cleveland Indians now moving on to be the Cleveland Guardians, but uh, I always like this um, this quote by uh, Michael Hanley Seminole. Mascots are offensive. This is a human rights issue. We are based. We are being denied the most basic respect. As long as our people are perceived as cartoon characters or static beings locked in the past, our social economic problems, our successes will never be seriously addressed. Also, the issue of imagery has a direct correlation with violence against Indian people and the high suicide rate for youth. And, you know, I, 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 I'm just amazed on, on how a lot of this stuff started picking up after the murder of George Floyd, um, community protests that now, you know, like here in Denver, they formed a committee and now they're changing the names of um, landmarks and libraries that were, um, you know, that were, you know, kind of celebrating individuals that took part in this Sand Creek massacre. And, 
and, and cities, municipalities are, are really doing a really good job of, of looking at that, getting, you know, I just read the other day that um, um, Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, now we're gonna look at the, the issue of squaw, the, the term squaw and other derogatory names. Um, I know Squaw Valley in Utah have, has recently, you know, removed that um, and, and moving away from that. So again, we're, we're in a very interesting time. And, and again, this is, this is a exercising of civil rights, Native people. Um, again, the intersections of, of Indian identity is, is an interesting dynamic because uh, the reality is where Native people are, we're right in the middle where they intersect. Um, and and that, that's something to always be, um, you know, a factor in when you're working with Native people. Again, um, urban Indians is, is not a kind of Indian. It's an experience, one that most Indian people have had. And, and that's what you're dealing with in uh, Flagstaff. So I think uh, a lot of folks on this call want to, you know, learn a little bit about the uh, Denver American Indian Commission. So when I was hired um, in 2004 um, to work in the agency, it, basically what happened was I had a chance meeting with this guy, his name is John Hickelooper. He's a state Senator now for the state of Colorado. But at the time he was the, he was running for mayor. And I was on, I was on a bike and I'm, I'm riding from the Denver Indian Center back home. And this is uh, 2003. And we, we had a board meeting at the Indian Center. And I saw this little, I saw like barbecue and I said, oh, I'm hungry. I'm gonna go over there and see what's going on over there. And I rode my bike over there and this is, this little skinny white guy with the oversized suit. And we started talking and he said that he was running for Denver mayor. And he, he said, and I just said, oh, I'm just coming from the Denver Indian Center and just started talking really positive about the native community, all the, 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 the great things that were happening in Denver. We had the Native American Bank. We had the Native American Rights Fund up in Boulder. We had the American Indian College Fund that had, uh, basically moved and established in the mid 1990s. And he was just looking at me and he said, you know, I, I like how you talk. I like how you really talk about the native community for, with so much passion. And he said, if I get elected, I'm gonna be calling you. I was like, oh, okay. Got my burger, jumped on the bike, went home. Well, the guy won. It was, an, it was like an upset because it was like eight people running and he got elected. And sure enough, I get a, a phone call and they said, the mayor wants you to apply for look at uh, these positions. And if any of them interest you, he's going to put is an endorsement behind you. And so that's how I got my job. And again, I think that that's an important thing because uh, I think they were looking at me to just be a, uh, a liaison to, between, you know, the mayor, city council and the native community. But I quickly found that, um, you know, some people didn't like that, you know, some people, you know, this lateral oppression that happens in our community, you know, some natives, um, you know, they were jealous because I was Navajo. Some of them were jealous because I'm, I identify with being mixed blood um, and quickly found out I was getting arrows in the back. And, 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 and the neat thing about the city of Denver was they had this structure um, from the 1940s um, and it was the agency for human rights and community partnerships. And so Within that agency, they have 10 offices and 10 uh, commissions. So they work with 10 commissions that have been communities that have been um, historically disenfranchised. So in 2007, the, uh, the native community um, um, supported the idea that we're gonna move from this mayor's, they used to call it the mayor's American Indian Council. And it, they would only meet two or three times a year. And it was pretty, there were yelling matches and the mayor would show up and get attacked. And so through this commission model, what it did was it created some formal administrative formal processes where the, we would meet monthly and we, we've met every month since 2008, January, 2008, we've been meeting once a month. Uh, we have bylaws, which the, the commission created. And I definitely can share all that information with Rose. And um, they came up with a mission, and that was to um, enhance present and future communications between the Denver Native community and the city and county of Denver to advocate 
for social and cultural awareness and to promote economic and political equality. And um, I think that's important. And I think for the last 14 years, that's what we've been doing. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the economic import, uh, impact report that we did in 2015. Uh, earlier this year, we, we, we updated our resource guide, which um, again, I will share that with Rose and she can share a copy with you all. Um, it just talks about all the um, American Indian organizations, uh, not just in the Denver, but the front range. That's like from Carl Springs all the way up to Fort Collins. And we have some amazing organizations. And so when you see that document, that's power. It's, it's like, whoa. And, and I love seeing reactions from Native people when they do see that. Um, the American Indian interse intersexuality is, is uh, Indian identity is fluid. Uh, the past and the present coexist. Urban contemporary is not in opposition to reservation uh, traditional. Communal values and ownership concepts are not mutually exclusive. Self-determination is a fundamental aspect of sovereignty. And so, you know, the, the bullet there about the ownership concepts and, and mutual, um, um, ownership and communal ways is, a, is an interesting dynamic. What, after I left Indian Aid, I worked for about two years with an Indian housing. I worked, I was the national director for their Native Peoples Initiative. And, and one of the things that um, was just mind blowing was American Indians on reservations were not allowed to own a home until 1994. And, and that, that is mind boggling because that's where wealth is generated and made mostly. mostly. And so they created this uh, section 184 program and, and, and it's been expanded over the years. And it's, it's all about um, encouraging uh, home ownership and, and uh, building wealth. And when I was working with Habitat, I, I, I use this analogy often. Somebody who was from the reservation, my, let's say one of my cousins, the, the beautiful thing about communal way, they, you, they, they'll find $100. They'll find a $100 bill. And, and, a, and a lot of natives, how they're wired is they're going to say, okay, I got an opportunity to give $10 to each one of my relatives. You know, grandma, mom, you know, cousin, this and that. And, and that's a beautiful thing. But in terms of like me growing up in, in Denver and being, you know, urbanized, you know, it's, it's instilled in us to you find a hundred dollars, you maybe keep 20 and put the, put the 80 in the bank. And, and so it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of that. And, and I think that's that, that, that conflicting concept of identity and, and, and values, it, it really has a, um, a really profound effect on, on Native people because they're, they're trying to figure it out. And I truly believe that through, through commissions and, and, and indigenous initiatives like you're doing in, in Flagstaff, that's where you have that opportunity to, to, to bring further discussion and, and role models and, and, and the opportunity to, to level the playing field. I, um, I know that uh, my presentation, uh, I didn't do the presentation about the commission because I wanted, Rose wanted me to do this, but um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, community partners that we have is the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. It's a policy think tank here in Denver. And um, for the last 17, 18 years, they've been putting on the international um, um, indigenous uh, film and art um, festival here in Denver. And um, about 12 years ago, their founder, uh, one of their principals uh, approached me and we had worked together at CERT, the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, um, you know, in the early nineties. And uh, she said, hey, we get, we get some submissions of films and we can't, uh, we, don't, we don't get a chance to use those films. Um, maybe this would be a good idea to work with the commission and we could start showing them once a month, you know, right, right after your, your commission meetings. And we started to do it at a city owned venue um, called Crossroads. Uh, it was a little community theater and small little venue, didn't hold that many. We quickly blew out of that. We eventually went to a, a theater, um, not too far from where we were still downtown called Su Teatro. It was a really big uh, venue and, but it was uh, logistically, it was kind of awkward. And then 
the partnership grew and we started to work with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And, and you know, we've been there uh, seven years now and I, uh, it, it's, it's really cool because we show native documentaries on, on, the, on, on big screens and we bring in the directors, actors, and, and after each film, there's a facilitated um, uh, discussion about you know, the topic. Uh, urbanization, uh, you know, Black Mesa, Water Coalition, whatever, these things, we have all these different things that we talk about in Indian country. And, and um, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. And I know that we were averaging about 70-ish uh, person, you know, people showing up for the films, but then COVID hit and then they went to this uh, online platform, this virtual platform, and now, I'm proud to say that, you know, the monthly um, viewership is around 300 on average. And, and I think um, it's, it's important to talk a little bit about the, um, that, that community partnerships because the commission, it's, it's all about relationships and, and uh, it's building relationships because what I found is in, in, in Denver and it probably happens in, in Flagstaff and in Northern Arizona is these Indian organizations doing great things, but they're very siloed and there's really not a lot of um, cross pollination of the work that they're doing. And I think that's where the commission comes into effect is it's uplifting. It's uplifting what the what these Indian native organizations are doing and, and, and maximizing and bringing resources from the city to, to what these nonprofits are doing. Um, Early on, I talked a little bit about, you know, writing the, the Indian education proposal from an assets perspective. Uh, I have a buddy here in Denver that we do skateboarding with, and his name is Walt Puryear, and he has a nonprofit called um, the Stronghold Society. And there was a period there where we were ultimately putting on the largest skateboarding event in the United States for natives right here in Denver. And, and when, when, when Walt and I first started working together in 2009, 2010. He and I were like, he, he grew up skateboarding and I grew up running and we were like, whoa, we were just vibing, you know, two native guys and these Lakota and the Navajo. And we said, you know, this is really a powerful thing because when, when you consistently berate and you tell native people that they come from poverty, they come from um, alcoholism, diabetes, no education, just sad, despair, poverty, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so one of the things that we do with the commission and, and the, the, the partnerships that we have with um, IIIRM and, and, and Stronghold Society is that we're, we're, we're uplifting the community. We're talking about the assets and that's where you're going to get results. You're going to get results when when you're when you're doing that uplifting speak and and empowering native people i i know it for a fact i've been you know been working in indian country you know since coming out of college what 40 years now and um it's really an interesting dynamic because it, it i get native people to come up to me all the time and say I love what you're talking about. This is so good because they're just so used to hearing negativity and they're not good. And so um, this definitely is an opportunity with the commission and I'd like to uh, answer any questions from Rose or any of the individuals that are part of the, this new commission or anybody that's on, the, um, on this particular call right now, the Zoom, and uh, just wanted to open up. And before we did that, Rose, did you want to um, or Jenna, did you want uh, to give any type of uh, direction? Well, firstly, um, Darius, for all the work that you've done uh, on behalf of indigenous people there in Denver and surrounding areas, as well as out here, you know, your reach um, has come to Flagstaff and you're wanting to help our, our people here and our city here is really, um, just a really good feeling to have that you know that you have somebody that you can say how did this work for you do you think this idea will work you know that kind of thing and so i'm looking forward to just kind of having those kinds of chats with you um some of our i believe some of our commission members are on 
um, Indigenous Commission members who are here. Um, I'd like, I, if you can, maybe you can turn on your cameras just to say hi, or if you ask, want to ask a question, that's fine too. Um, some of the things that I know that we've been working on are um, we had a we we had a grassroots people um, indigenous circle of lifestyle who who with the help and partnership with the city and city leadership that brought to, together recommendations from these forums and you know by all means it's not everything that people have brought up but but we're able to um, bring together some things that kept coming to the top as a need and as a concern and as um, dreams for our indigenous people here in Flagstaff. So based on that, that's um, how our commission started. It's how my job started here. And um, I really am, you know, that we have a lot to do as far as growth wise. But at the same time, I'm also very proud of our city council as well as our leadership here at the city that they've been listening to us and that they're willing to take this chance and make a commitment to um, indigenous um, indigenous people in the area, and as well as building relationship um, stronger relationships with our indigenous nations that are within this area that come to that come here not as tourists, but as people who are from the area and there are people who call this area home and know it as home. Um, so I just want to just say thank you on their behalf and for all our um, people here in the audience, they have their reasons for being here. Uh, and I'm really thankful to those that are here that are from our city, um, city employees that have made a commitment to be a part of our audience today. I'm just so really proud of them and thankful to them. Um, so if you, I, will, I think I saw um, Commissioner Weathersby on, on the list. If you can just pop on here and say hello. Um, I don't know if our Commissioner Kadia is on the line or as well, but you're welcome to un um, to get yourself on video and to say hello or ask a question. But I really want to just recognize the ones that are here from our commission first, and then we'll go from there to um, any questions. Yeah. 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 I hope they're not fumbling with their... <laughs> there she is. Hello. I have to get my yeah, eh? Um, she a tetanus that name is lit, although not his lead chicken saw chop tall, Mr. Bidant, the Kagi, Bush team, Tachini, Dutch, although not his lead charity, Louisiana, Dan, the Kagi, that's another uh, care what is being a shesh, a kisan, a dan, a shah. Um, I just wanted to say, if you had, um, really appreciate the uh, knowledge and, um, information that you shared with everyone and with everyone who uh, took their time to come and listen to you. Um, I know that there are so many teachings that, um, that you shared today that, um, that are so important that our, um, our relatives within the community understand and know why we um, do the work that we do and um and so i just really wanted to say yeah i really appreciate you um creating um uh, this this very informative uh lecture and sharing with all of us today and um i look forward to learning more from you and um but i don't have a question i feel like you really covered uh, a lot of the um, information and um just wanted to say uh, to give my gratitude to you for for uh, taking the time today. Okay, appreciate it. And before one of the other commissioners talks, I, I I thought about what the city council did in Denver last October. They created a land acknowledgement in collaboration with the Denver American Indian Commission, and um, 
in the land acknowledgement, it's just, you know, four short paragraphs, but what the city of Denver is doing now is pretty amazing. They didn't just read it on Indigenous Peoples Day. They read it every Monday. They, every city council member, they take turns, they alternate reading the land acknowledgement 52 times a year. So it's not just one time, one off. And, and what we're doing here in Denver is that we're putting action behind this land acknowledgement. The city of Denver owns two bison herds, 30 up in Genesee, West going off I-70, and then in a little area called Daniels Park. And up till this year, they used to have an auction whenever they, when the, the bison would, would start having babies and baby bison, they, they would sell those off. But then the, they realized this was an opportunity. And so now they're giving the, the bison. So we gave 13 to the Cheyenne and Arapaho this year. And six of those 13 were pregnant. So that we actually, in, in essence, the city of Denver gifted about 20 bison to the Cheyenne and Arapaho. So now we're working proactively with the Intertribal Bison Co Council. We're going to be working with their membership to make sure that we get the bison out um, and again, that's putting action behind a land acknowledgement that are just words. And so, um, again, I get real passionate about this. I'd like to hear from any other uh, commissioner on the call. Hello, can you hear me? This is Diana. Hey, Diana. Oh, yeah. Uh, I yes, and Jana, Bahunjna. Yeah. My name is um, Diana Kadi. I share your heart, my dash is Ninshle. Oze Tachini, Pashish Chin, Ashin Dash another, Tachini Dash Che. Ado Anast Ado Natani Nazda Adi Shiaho. My name is Diana Kadi, and I am originally from the Four Corners area of Shabrat, New Mexico, and Cove, Arizona. Um, I really related to your mom. In, um, in her experience at, in uh, a boarding school survivor, mm -hmm. because my mom was also, she was taken to um, Oklahoma along with my other aunt. My younger aunt was not my, my Chiche. Um, they say that they, he uh, hid her mm -hmm. um, to, to keep her home. Um, and then I was, um, I was, um, in boarding school, um, in the Four Corners area in, in Arizona, uh, for six years. So I was, um, there since I was five. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, when I, when I run across other, um, people that have gone to boarding schools, um, it's conflicting. Some say it was the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> then some say it was the worst thing, you know, and I glean from it just what I, what has made me be the woman, the Navajo woman that I am today. Um, I'm resilient and, and I'm powerful and I'm invincible. And there are stormy days, just like anybody else that I have in my life, but I'm always grateful for the family that I'm with, or for people who have always been there um, and will always be there. And that's usually family that I can count on. Mm -hmm. um, I have family that were taken to um, the relocation, uh, part of the relocation act that you were talking about um, for work um, and school uh, to California. And, um, and they lived there all their lives. And I remember visiting them one time uh, when I was young. And it, it was, as young as I was, I noticed that the, the children of my great aunts that were there, they were dealing drugs right there in the house. <laughs> I, and I was like, I knew it was wrong. I, I don't know how I knew that. I just knew it was, it just wasn't right. And then we went to um, a store. My mom, my dad took us to a store and there's this big white guy, um, big guy, just yelled at us. 
to get out of there and and just screaming um swear words at my mom my dad you know and I remember turning around we're walking out my mom's taking us out of there and I look back at my mom and she's crying mm-hmm. and I and I I always remember I hate the cities <laughs> I don't like the cities you know um but I was in a way um, grateful to my dad who who challenged those boundaries in a way he only had a third grade education mm-hmm. and and had to lie about his age to work in the railroad but um he had common sense and he was a strong man who challenged the boundaries by taking us he was a very adventurous he's a very adventurous dad my, my, my dad he's still alive but um he used to take us on these what I call budget vacations. We all go in a little these um, um, station wagon, and we go. We went to cities to Chicago, St. Louis, mm. where you could sleep in the rest areas at that time. I don't know how my dad got around. He didn't really read, mm. you know. So I think there are ways that we can really grasp our own historical trauma, our cultural trauma, and our intergenerational trauma in a way that um, being grateful to our ancestors for surviving the most harshest conditions and the most cruelest treatment. Mm -hmm. Somehow we were meant to be here and we we still are surviving. I've lived in Denver. My, my husband, he's also, he's on Turtle Mountain Chippewa from, from um, Belcourt, North Dakota. And we're both professionals. Mm. And so um, we lived in Denver. And um, I worked there and I actually, I, I met Mr. Echo Hawk at a um, school meeting of some sort. I can't remember. Yeah. And and I met the, the native people there, but I didn't really meet a lot of um, other native people, but I did go to the powwow a couple of times on the west side, the, the Indian center there. I think it's the Indian center there. Yes. So, I mean, I tried, to, I tried to always be engaged in the native community wherever I lived. But anyway, so long, I'm sorry, I, I'm making this really long, but, um, I just wanted to say, I say, yeah, uh, thank you for, for giving us this present, a different view of a presentation that most of us uh, Native people know about, but we still need reinforcement that we are so strong. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And a lot of the stuff that I got from that was the trauma and the microaggressions and thing, those things, they compound and ultimately it, it just creates this... Um, you know, fear and it, it creates isolation. And that's what native people do is that often they, they self-isolate to the point where, you know, they're too, you know, it's, you know, I can go all day into that, but it's, it's, it's a real thing. And, and, you know, over the years, one of the things that I really do is help Navajos and help native people navigate systems. And so uh, a perfect example of that is we come from oral traditions. And, and, and so we want to tell our story and, that's what I do is I listen to Navajo people and native people. They tell me the story and they're like, I've been discriminated against. And then I'm like, okay, you're done. I don't have jurisdiction. You're going to have to go over to the state and file a complaint over there, but this is what you're going to say. And I give them a script to read. I said, that story that you told me was a very, very powerful story. However, now when you're dealing with this government agency at the state level, I, I need you to go this, this, and this. I've been discriminated because of, you know, my, my gender, of my, of my ethnicity, and, and, I, and this is why. And, and, and they look at me, and they're like, you know what? That's where I see a lot of government officials. They don't, they don't have the patience to listen and, and appreciate what oral, oral tradition is all about. As government officials and, and agents of the government, that's what we have to do is we have to help individuals move that oral story 
to a form or, or whatever. And, and it, it's, it's changing the, the rules of engagement. And, and I think that's what I've seen with native people in Denver is, you know, they like to tell these story, they love to, and, and I do it. I, I mean, that's what I'm doing today is I'm telling a story. But at, at the same time, when I have to deal with a government system, I'm gonna just say, boom, 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 I'm done. And so I think that's what I've learned over the last 18 years. Any other commissioners have any questions or want to say something? Uh, I think those are all the commissioners we have on, uh, on online. But what I wanted to say was before, uh, I don't see any other questions or comments in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this time to just say that um, I think a lot of the times um, we need to have this kind of this foundational um, background stories of, of how of how we are as indigenous people for those we work with those we live with as neighbors and as we walk through this urban area um, off our nation lands then um, you know although it is indigenous lands everywhere it's it's there's still that political boundary and so, we need to have this background and this foundational story for, for our other relatives to understand where, where we're coming from. And I really liked where you said that we're, or we're um, people that have oral traditions and our white relatives are really more about get to the bottom line, you know, what's the point, that kind of thought way. And so to kind of get this together to where we both understand each other is really important. And that's where we're trying to get some of these conversations online so that we are able to have um, maybe questions and have some thoughts about how we're able to um, stop and say, okay, we need to have this person, I need to give some time for this person to tell their story so I can get to the point of what, what it is that they need to report. So those are some things that we're, we're hoping that we are able to achieve through our, our interactions and our um, having people like you be up here to tell, um, to, to say what your job is when you're, now that you're in this position working with people um, getting to get to resolution of something. So I can't have for that. Well, you know, and it, we're, we're doing real good on time here. We're, we're ending, going to end right on time. And that, that's always, uh, you know, we got to respect everybody's time. But, you know, that navigation piece is so crucial. And, and I think that, you know, my mother teases me because what, what I, Native people reach out to me and they're like, I, I want to apply for this job. I want to apply for financial aid. I want to file a wage claim. I want to file, you know, um, I need a letter of recommendation or something like that. And I'll say, let's move it to Friday. So I do all my native stuff on Fridays, which is really cool because I get to actually have further conversations with people. And then um, I think that, you know, my job, I have a one of a kind position in the country. And I think that, you know, it allows me to, to just really meet with people, talk where they're at and just say, okay, this is what, this is who you're going to talk to over there. And this is what you're going to say. And, and often I do writer's workshops. And so this is something where you can engage like students from the University of uh, Northern um, Arizona and, and helping individuals uh, develop um, uh, resumes and bios because that's how I see the commission in Denver. We, since 2008, we've had 60 individuals serve as commissioners because we have bylaws, we have term limits. And this is leadership development. We have now natives on other commissions now. And so it's a launching pad to do that. And so I'm definitely going to share with you, Rose, um, the bylaws and, and just all these things that the commission has gone through. And then, and then also just, just kind of show you, give you an idea of how intertribal the commission is in Denver, because you have a lot of tribes. I mean, gosh, she, she had five tribes uh, just with her alone. So I think <laughs> I know. that's an opportunity. Yeah, and it's not just uh, a Navajo thing or, or a Hopi thing, and 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 again, this is it's been a pleasure being on this um, Zoom today, and I just I just think what you all are doing in in Flagstaff is um, much needed, and I'm gonna be a resource for you all. Thank you, Darius. We sure appreciate it. I mean, right now when we're just getting started, now I just really receive you as a blessing. 
as our ancestors and our relatives say for that that blessing that you've come this way with appreciate it so all right everybody um this is the end of our um, conversation with darius and um you'll we'll keep in touch later on um regarding evaluation and things like that so uh it will might take a little bit more time because of holidays and whatnot but we'll keep in touch with you all of you and thank you for being here with us everybody again <laughs>